So my lecture or talk is dedicated to an exceptional French personality called Jean Malory. You probably saw the name uh, in um, the announcement, so I put the name here again. It's the name in English. Uh, Les Derniers Rois de Tully. So, um, uh, here you have a photograph of him coming back from an expedition to the north of Tully, where the northwest of Greenland is uh, um, a point furthest north inhabited on Earth uh, by indigenous people. Uh, and uh, he, in the year, in the winter 50 51, uh, was given the opportunity to go on an expedition further up north to do some cartographic missions and research uh, together with two Inuit couples. And on his return, he came back and, and a photograph was taken of him in this um, dress. So uh, this is a very well-known photograph now of him uh, that has been circulating wide. As, um, you can see his birth certificate here, here uh, from Germany, written in old German handwriting, which hasn't been taught in school for many, many years now. And uh, most people now cannot read this. So, so um, uh, as I said earlier on, he was born in 1922 in Mainz. Um, so um, I already explained the circumstances why his family is uh, on his father's side uh, from a Jansenist family. Uh, the Jansenists are a special group of uh, Roman Catholics, uh, which uh, um, have a more traditional, let's say, approach to practicing their faith. They were a very, very strong component in the 17th century in French intellectual life, up to the point that the Jesuits intrigued to have them uh, banned by the French king, which is what happened in um, um, uh, 1713, if I remember correctly, so there is uh, not far from my university a famous monastery called uh, Port Royal. And the Jansenists uh, were uh, therefore they're famous for having developed their own uh, grammar of, of the French language and a translation of the Bible, which was the reference um, um, that people used for many, many years when they were reading the Bible in French. Uh, uh, famous philosopher Blaise Pascal was part of this group and many other people who you probably don't know. So um, his father came from a family um, that continued to practice their Catholic faith in this way. Um, that meant, for, exa for example, for Malory, um, in the evening when you say your prayers, to uh, not uh, say them in bed when you're lying under the cover and feeling well, but to kneel down on your knees next to the bed and say your prayers. And uh, also, uh, he often talks about the memory of his own father having a cross of Jesus Christ with Jesus Christ on his office desk and, and um, uh, Jesus Christ being in this position uh, rather than as we see him usual and the symbol and, and the sign. So he grew up in Mainz, as I said, in the first eight years of his life. And then um, uh, the family went back to uh, Germany where he was sent uh, to a, pre a prestigious school called um, Ecole, uh, sorry, Henri IV, uh, the, um, the gymnasium, you would say probably, or, or Lycée, Henri IV is one of the best schools in France, secondary schools. And um, uh, in France, we have a special system. We have universities, but we also have highly selective so-called big schools or uh, Grande Ecole, they're called in French, uh, with a very, very selective entrance exam, a bit like Oxbridge or Oxford or Cambridge in the UK. And you prepare that exam for a couple of years before you actually uh, do the exam. So he had classes at school to prepare this exam. Um, uh, and these classes include usually um, general culture, philosophy, languages, and so on and so forth. So, um, I, and he said that he was frustrated with the teaching in philosophy. So, um, in 4849, he went on two solitary missions to Algeria. You can see him there on the left-hand side uh, in the Hoga Desert, absolutely amazing. Uh, mountainside and uh, several thousand meters high and then uh, uh, also uh, in Greenland. So on the right hand side you can see a photograph of um, the moment when he had arrived in Tula. I, I don't have a map here, perhaps you can look it up yourselves. We're in the northwest of Greenland, uh, very high up. And um, so at this time this was a big adventure because a um, Greenland was a Danish colony, it still belongs to the King of Dan Denmark but now has a, a kind of um, large autonomy, as it were. Uh, but in those days, um, it was impossible to come to Greenland if you did not have authorization from uh, the Danish government. Uh, so, uh, and uh, Tule was almost impossible to go to because um, uh, the place was complete title of having reached the North Pole for the first time. And this man was old by this time, said, okay, um, 
I will give you my son Kutsi Kitsok and he, he will help you to organize your expedition. All right, so um, yeah, it was decided to go on the expedition and um, uh, but um, one person was not enough and um, uh, so he wanted to have two companions and it so happened this is quite remarkable in the history of exploration and from the point of view of gender studies that the wives of the two men wanted to accompany him so they set out five people together him and two couples and uh, then they went as you can see it here on this expedition along the coast and uh, also crossing over to canada because it was frozen over uh, into Ellesmere land in the winter 1950-51. So uh, this is an extraordinary mission. Uh, once again, he had no um, um, means. So um, he, uh, uh, in this slide, you can see the story that uh, I was telling about just beforehand, um, that um, <clears throat> he decided to do that uh, dog sledge trip on his own. And um, um, uh, what you can see is a photograph from this time. Uh, of his companion Kutsi Kitsok and himself uh, doing uh, a raid on on them on their own and reaching the geomagnetic pole uh, for the first time. This is the first recorded um, attaining of the geomagnetic pole, not the North Pole, right? There's a separate thing called the geomagnetic pole, and they reached it in 1951. Um, so you can see a photograph of that, and and on the right hand side you can see uh, we use the photograph for um, the um, translation of a 23 page long excerpt from his new book where he tells the story of how he went on his own um, um, dog sledge trip for the first time in Greenland. All right, so this is, has just come out right now in Germany uh, in uh, the prestigious review Lettre Internationale. And uh, as you can tell from the cover already, what is very special is that he decided on the cover not to put his own photograph, but to have the photograph of his companion, Kutsi Kitsok. Um, making the point that um, the real heroes are not uh, the explorers from, from, from Europe, but the people who are living there. All right, we are 1955, uh, 10 years after the Second World War. Uh, we're still um, in the times when uh, countries like England, uh, the UK have colonies, but at the moment where people are beginning to uh, reflect on the impact of colonization in the world and um, so um, he decides to publish this book and to create a book series uh, which has become very famous since then and which is one of his great achievements in life in France um, called uh, Terrumen. He decided at the same time as he was going to publish his book you know, The Last Kings of Thule to create uh, found a book series um, and what he had in mind was to create a book series that would um, allow for a dialogue between different um, people coming from all walks of life uh, because he was convinced that um, you would never reach um, a satisfying state of truth as it were in general or, or a full picture of things <clears throat> if you would um, restrict your way yourself to reading only academics, for instance, or in anthropology, same thing if you would only read a trained professional anthropologist to talk about other people. Anyway, uh, the other book you can see on the picture here is uh, called Le Cheval d'Orgueil, The Horse of Pride. And it became an absolute monumental bestseller and a, a major cultural phenomenon in France uh, after its publication in the late 1970s, because it talks about Breton culture. Um, now, in Berlin, we had a very interesting discussion about uh, tradition. Uh, the, we had a Sami guest speaker who was talking about traditional ways and saying, uh, you know, we are proud of our traditional ways. And I think in the Ukraine, you are too. Um, in, in Western Europe, people have had a much more complex attitude since the Second World War to uh, tradition and folklore, what we call folklore sometimes. Another important book uh, published just a year after was uh, by a, a famous French uh, poet called Jacques Lacarrière. Uh, who wrote about Greece uh, and he called the Greek summer. So um, it became very, very popular as well and sold another one million copies. Now, Lacarrière was asked later on how he, how he would account for the success of this book. And he said, well, probably because I call it Greek summer and people were thinking I'm writing about beaches. You know? <laughs> but uh, in fact, I call it Greek summer because my theme is eternal Greece, how Greece has continued to exist since antiquity until today. And for me, it's one continuous culture. You know? Anyway, these are just uh, some of the best known titles in the book series. 
And um, you can see at the bottom on the right hand side a photograph of, of the authors of the book series uh, being received by President Jacques Chirac in 2005 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of this book collection. We have another slide, yes, and that's, this is the latest. Uh, so um, there's an exhibition organized in Monaco of his artwork. Uh, Leon in France, if you get a volume dedicated to you in this collection, this is a kind of review that does uh, single author volumes. If you get to yourself a volume in this collection, you have reached the absolute top in France. Um, so um, I was asked to um, co-direct this volume dedicated to him. And uh, you can see us on the right hand side, joking about the fact that uh, we have such excellent contact, though he is French and I'm German. So there we are. <laughs> Thank you.